book of the month. Follow the link to buy your copy. It's September and our catechism classes based on the Heidelberg Catechism have recommenced. If you haven't got a copy of the catechism, then I would really urge you to purchase a copy and to keep it and to read it. It will be a worthwhile addition to any library. And a personal paper copy is probably essential for any meaningful study of the plain and practical Christian teachings that the Catechism contains. So for September, the Heidelberg Catechism will be our Book of the Month. Links to buy your copy at just £2.95 can be found on the episode notes during September. Or contact me by email. The email address is bob at bobmacavoy.co.uk September's Book of the Month the Heidelberg Catechism. When you buy a copy, a small amount of the price supports this podcast. Welcome to our Catechism class. It's a weekly look at the Heidelberg Catechism to help you learn Christian doctrine with a warm and practical application. Each lesson has its own study guide, and the web link to find that guide can be found in the episode notes. Okay, let's start the lesson. So welcome to our Catechism class, and in this lesson, the first lesson in our new season, we're looking at Lord's Day 21, question 55. The Catechist asks us, what do you understand by the communion of saints? And the answer we ought to give is that first all believers, all and every one, as members of Christ, have communion with him and share in his and all his treasures and gifts. Second, that everyone is duty-bound to use his gifts readily and cheerfully for the benefit and well-being of the other members. So we're looking at this phrase in the Apostles' Creed, which says, I believe in something called the communion of saints. So what is a saint? And what is communion? And how does it affect us? Let's find out. I'm Bob McAvoy, and this is the Semper Reformata Podcast. So let's tackle this issue of saints, first of all. When our catechist asks what we understand by the communion of saints, he actually answers his own question by referring to those saints using the term believers. And he's quite right. A saint is literally just a believer in Jesus, not a dead holy man or holy woman, not someone who's been canonized by a church, but an ordinary everyday Christian. When Paul wrote to the churches, he frequently addressed the Christians in those churches as saints. Ephesians 1 and 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Saint is hagios. It simply means holy, separated. And that is exactly what Christians are. People who have been washed and cleansed and made clean in the blood of the Lord Jesus. People who are called out of the world as separated people, separated unto God. Now, every single one of those believers has fellowship, has a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, Paul writes, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, what's a relationship like? I recently saw a cartoon on social media, one of these memes, and it read, Religion is a man sitting in a church thinking about fishing. Relationship is a man sitting in a boat with a fishing rod thinking about Jesus. That's exactly right. Our catechist tells us that 
all of us who know Christ as our Saviour, each and every one of us, or as another translation of the Catechism reads, all of us in common. All believers are members of Christ. Paul alludes to this also when he teaches us that we are all members of Christ's body, the Church. If you have your Bible, read 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So we all have a part in, we all have fellowship with the Lord Jesus. And the basis of the fellowship is our mutual forgiveness of sins, our saving union with Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us that God made Jesus to be sin for us, that we might be made the perfect righteousness of God in him. Read in your Bible 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So think of my sin as an account. Think of your sin as an account. And every time we sin, the account builds up, every sin adding to the amount we owe. And eventually, well, actually, not eventually, but from the start, it becomes an account so large that you or I could never, ever pay it off. But Jesus is sinless, and he perfectly fulfilled God's law, so his account is totally clear. He has no debt to pay. At the cross, though, my debt, my sin, is led to Christ's account, and he paid for it. And all my debt is now paid. It is cancelled. And at the same time, his perfect righteousness is granted. I suppose the proper word is imputed to me. I am therefore in Christ. I am clothed in his righteousness. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. And the prophet, speaking many years before the birth of Christ, said this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me in the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Before we go any further, let's pause for a moment and let's worship God. We're going to sing Psalm 122, verse 3 to 9 from Sing Psalms. The tune is Sussex. See Jerusalem like a city, built compactly, close and strong. That is where the tribes assemble, tribes which to the Lord belong. To the Lord's name praise they offer, as for Israel decreed. There are set the thrones for judgment, thrones of David's royal seed. Pray for Zion's peace and safety. May your friends securely dwell. Peace within your walls continue. Strength within your citadel. For the sake of friends and brothers, peace be in you, I will say. For the sake of our God's temple, I seek your prosperity. Psalm 122, verse 3 to 9.
this common membership of Christ that we all have bestows great benefits upon us. The Catechism tells us that we have two particular types of benefit. Firstly, we have treasures or riches, all those spiritual blessings which Christ bestows on every believer. And we have gifts. Think of the gifts that we all have in common as Christians. God's grace and mercy, his love and his goodness, his loving kindness, his salvation, the forgiveness of sins, his indwelling Holy Spirit, helping us, strengthening us, comforting us, Christ's ministry of intercession for us, his defence of us, his promise to keep us, many, many more wonderful, undeserved gifts given to every believer. In fact, in the book of John, John chapter 1 and verse 16, we read, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Or in Romans 8 and 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And yet there are gifts that are given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ, which are not common to all believers. Some of us have particular gifts, gifts that are given to individual Christians for use among the Lord's people. Paul explains this for us in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 7. He says there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So some believers are called to be preachers, or teachers, or missionaries, or youth workers, or pastors, or elders, or deacons, or church workers, others to a ministry of intercession, or caring, or administration, or encouragement. There are particular gifts given to individual believers. But what are those gifts given for? And that's where the second part of our catechism question and answer really helps us. When God gives gifts to a believer over and above the graces and gifts that are common to every Christian, he does so in order that that believer can use those gifts to bless the rest of the fellowship. God doesn't give a man the wonderful gift of preaching or teaching in order that the man may make a reputation for himself as a great preacher, or in order that he might obtain book deals or ministry tours overseas or get rich. He is so gifted in order to bless the church. Let's read what Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. Down to verse 8. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So the catechist echoes that. The catechist insists that everyone is duty-bound to use his gifts readily and cheerfully for the benefit and well-being of the other members. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4 and 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Actually, I think that applies to both types of spiritual gift, not just those particular individual gifts, but the common gifts of grace that Christ gives to each of us. They should be shared. We're part of the fellowship of saints, and we share our mutual interest in Christ, and we share our love for him and for one another. First John 1 and 3 That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship 
is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Well, there's two things that remain to be said. Firstly, because all the gifts that are given to us by our Saviour are to bless others as well as ourselves, the purpose of our fellowshipping together becomes clear. We meet together to give, not to obtain. Years ago, there was a man who came to the church where I was the pastor. He came every week, and as he left, he would always be complaining about the meeting. He would say to me or to other people that he never seemed to get anything out of the service. He once told me, I came here to get blessed, and I'm getting no blessing at all. My response was a little bit cheeky. Perhaps a touch of frustration was setting in. I said, The reason you're not getting any blessing out of the meetings is because you came to get blessed. If you'd come to bless others, to give instead of to get, you might find that you're blessed too. Well, he wasn't pleased, but it's true. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. There's no room whatsoever for individualism in the body of Christ. Romans 12 and 5 So we being many are one body. In Christ, and every one members one of another. We're all gifted in some way, and we are given those gifts to bless and encourage our brothers and sisters. The real question for you and me personally is whether this attitude of love and service for other believers is characteristic of my Christian life, and is it evident in my church, in my fellowship? The second issue that confronts us here is that we sometimes think of communion as being synonymous with the Lord's Supper. Some churches speak of this sacrament as Holy Communion. It is. It is symbolic of our union with Christ as we witness the elements, bread and wine, speaking to us of his body and his blood. We commune with the Lord and we commune with each other. But it would be wrong to think of the Lord's Supper as the full extent of our fellowship. It is more than that. Our fellowship is a living relationship. That's what we've learned in this lesson. We have fellowship with Christ, and we have fellowship with each other in Christ. And what a fellowship that is. Or as a hymn writer said, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. Subscribe and give it a 5-star rating. See you next time.